Gibson's work is surprisingly relevant in, to rock climbing, almost as if he designed his theories while hanging from a cliff face. Hello, here's another video in which we look into the underlying concepts and principles of my book Climbing Performance Coaching. Today I want to show you how James J. Gibson reshaped how we think about perception by shifting the lens from internal processing to the meaningful action oriented information av available directly in our environment. Gibson's theories continue to inform diverse domains where understanding how people interact with their surroundings is essential. From for example aviation safety and technology in general to design and even climbing. Gibson is the pioneering psychologist behind ecological theories of perception. He transformed our understanding of perception by showing that it is less about internal inference and more about an organism directly engaging with the world. you a quick overview of ecological psychology and why it is one of the underlying principles in my book. The central idea is perception is direct and action orientated. We don't passively take in information and then think about what to do. Rather, we perceive the environment in terms of affordances, opportunities for motor action relative to our body and skills. For example, a flat rock surface affords standing, a narrow ledge affords balancing, a crimp affords gripping, but only if the climber's body and skill make it possible. So in ecological psychology, perception and action are inseparable. Movement emerges from the dynamic relationship between the climber and the environment, not from executing a pre-programmed technique in the abstract. So what differences does this make? What are the implications for climbing coaches? First of all, skill is seen as perception action coupling, not just body mechanics. Good climbing isn't just about strong fingers or memorized moves. It's about noticing and using what the wall affords. Coaching should foster sensitivity to hold body positions and movement options rather than drilling isolated techniques. Second, learning through variable practice. Instead of repeating the same move, climbers benefit from exploring varied wall angles, hold types and movement constraints. This variability strengthens adaptability because climbers learn to perceive new affordances in different contexts. Third, task design matters more than instructions. Rather than telling a climber how to move, like for example, drop your knee, shift your hips. Coaches can design problems that invite certain movements. For example, setting a boulder with widely spaced footholds encourages a high step without verbal instructions. Fourth, environment as a teacher. Changing wall angle, hold texture, or route setting can shape learning more effectively than verbal correction. The wall becomes part of the coaching process. Fifth, attunement to affordances. Beginners often miss subtle footholds or body position options. Coaches can guide attention towards affordances. For example, what else could you use here? 
instead of prescribing a single solution. Six, individualize movement solutions. Ecological psychology emphasizes that affordances depend on the individual. A hole that affords a jack to a tall climber might be unreachable for a shorter one. Coaching should respect these individual environment relations, not enforce one size fits all technique. These are some basic implications of ecological psychology for climbing coaches. Now back to JJ Gibson who came up with the underlying concepts. Choosing a route or committing to a move is about perceiving not just what the rock is, but what it allows you to do safely, giving your physical state, fatigue and available protection. This fits the ecological perspective. Perception is always embedded in an action context. Gibson's principles map directly to the micro decisions climbers make during a single move, from spotting a foothold to executing it. So we find ourselves in a continuous perception action loop. The moment your foot hits the ledge, you feel how solid it is, which changes what you see as possible for your next move. Perception and action are inseparable. Each movement creates new perceptual information guiding the next action. One fascinating concept of Gibson, especially for climbers, is that of active touch. In fact, we use it almost constantly, even if we don't realize it. What active touch means is that Gibson distinguished between passive touch, just feeling something pressed against your skin, and active touch, moving your body or fingers to explore and gather information. In active touch, movement is part of perception. You're not just receiving sensation, you're probing the world for affordances. It's obvious that this is really relevant to rock climbing. It helps you to identify holes without sight. When you can't see a hold, you might feel around above your head until your fingers find something to hold on to. So this way you can test hold quality. Climbers do a bounce test, a little bounce test. A hold with their fingers or hands to gouge is solidity. This is exploratory movement. The pressure micro slips and vibration inform whether the rock will hold weight. Active touch also allows you to access friction and texture. Feeling a sloper to decide if it's grippy enough depends on moving your palm and finger slightly to sense resistance. Active touch picks up affordances for smearing, palming or mantling. It's important for our safety. A quick tap or wiggle of a suspect rock flake can reveal instability, influencing whether you pull on it or you avoid it. Active touch is perception as action. The hand is not a passive sensor, it's an exploratory tool. 
It supports direct perception of affordances through haptic feedback. You feel whether something affords gripping, pushing, jamming, etc. without mentally modeling at first. In climbing, vision and touch work together. You see a possible hold, then confirm its affordance through active touch. In early childhood, it was hard to learn to coordinate seeing and touching. They cooperate with one another if one is not lightheaded, but a few drinks are all that is needed to break up the proper coordination of feeling and seeing. The simplest way to break up the cooperation of seeing and touching is a mirror. Looking into a mirror, one sees in front what is really behind, and therefore one reaches in the wrong direction. But the sensation of touch produces a kind of reversal of seeing. Here is a wet sponge slapped on his back. Now he feels as if he had eyes in the back of his head. It is similar when you feel things in this way. In this case, the fingers the sense organs are in front of you, but nevertheless, the touched object is immediately perceived as behind. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel and leave questions and suggestions in the comments. Cheers.